The encrypted message flashed on my secure terminal, its contents sending a jolt of adrenaline through me that was stronger than the Navy coffee coursing through my veins. Report to HQ immediately. Priority 1. Top secret. The cryptic nature of the summons was both familiar and unsettling. I'd spent the last decade in the murky world of naval intelligence, deciphering codes, analyzing data, piecing together fragments of information to anticipate threats, to protect our nation's secrets. But this, this felt different. A priority one message, delivered in the dead of night, it meant something big was brewing, something that even my clearance level wasn't privy to. I grabbed my go bag, the weight of it reassuringly familiar, a collection of essentials for a life lived on the edge, a life where orders came suddenly, without explanation, a life where you learn to trust your gut and keep your questions to yourself. HQ was a labyrinth of sterile corridors and windowless offices, a place where the air itself felt heavy with secrets, where every conversation was hushed, every glance measured, every shadow a potential threat. I was ushered into a conference room, the door clicking shut behind me, the sound of finality that made my stomach churn. Captain Reed was already there, his imposing figure a silhouette against the backdrop of a projected map. He was a legend in the Navy, a man who'd risen through the ranks with a ruthlessness that bordered on brutality. A man whose loyalty to the mission, to the chain of command, was unquestioned. His eyes, though, those were what always got to me, cold, calculating, as if he could see right through you, into the darkest corners of your soul. Lieutenant Kestrel, he acknowledged my presence with a curt nod, his voice a gravelly baritone that commanded attention. Glad you could join us. We're on a tight schedule. He turned his attention back to the map, his finger tracing a line across a swathe of blue that represented a vast, uncharted expanse of ocean. We've picked up some unusual activity, he said, his voice low, a hint of urgency in his tone. Seismic readings, electromagnetic anomalies, the kind that don't show up on standard instruments. He paused, letting the weight of his words settle in the silence. We've assembled a team, a covert unit to investigate. You've been selected for your unique skill set. He glanced at me, his gaze piercing, his words a challenge. Are you up for the task, Lieutenant? What's the mission, sir? I asked, even though I knew I shouldn't. He smiled, a thin, humorless twist of his lips. That's on a need-to-know basis, Lieutenant. And right now, you don't need to know. He gestured towards two figures standing in the shadows near the back of the room. One was tall and muscular, his military bearing unmistakable. Liam, marine demolition expert. The other, a man with a shock of white hair and a briefcase clutched tightly in his hand, stepped forward into the light. Dr. Keller, the man said, his voice surprisingly soft, a gentle counterpoint to Captain Reed's gravelly growl. Geophysicist. I'll be advising on the scientific aspects of the mission. He looked at me, his eyes a strange mix of curiosity and apprehension. We're going to be working closely together, Lieutenant. I hope you're not afraid of the dark. A shiver ran down my spine. The darkness. It wasn't the literal darkness of the deep ocean that worried me. It was the darkness of the unknown, the shadows that lurked in the corners of our understanding the secrets that the government, that men like Captain Reed, kept hidden from the world. And as we left the briefing room, the weight of the unspoken truth settling on me like a shroud, I knew, with a chilling certainty, that whatever we were about to face, it was something far more terrifying than anything I could have imagined. The air was thick with the smell of salt and diesel, the rhythmic thrum of the engines a constant reminder of our isolation. The Orca, a state-of-the-art submarine, cut through the choppy waters of the North Atlantic, heading towards a point on the map marked only by a string of classified coordinates. I stood on the bridge, watching the gray expanse of the ocean roll beneath the steel hull. The sun, a pale disk hanging low on the horizon, cast long, cold shadows that stretched across the water, mirroring the unease that had settled over the crew. The departure from the naval base had been shrouded in secrecy, 
the usual fanfare and flag-waving replaced by a hushed urgency, a sense of foreboding that hung in the air like a shroud. The mission briefing, deliberately vague, had only served to fuel the rumors that had been swirling among the crew. They say it's a Russian sub, a young sonar tech, his face pale, had whispered to me during the pre-deployment checks. Went down a few months back. No survivors. Now they're sending us to... Salvage it. I'd tried to reassure him, to project an air of confidence I didn't feel. But the truth was, I was just as in the dark as he was. Captain Reed, his face a granite mask, his eyes as cold and unforgiving as the Arctic winds, had given us only the barest essentials. A location, a series of unusual readings, a mission objective that was as clear as the murky depths we were heading towards, investigate and report. No heroics, gentlemen, he'd said, his voice a gravelly baritone that brooked no argument. This is a recon mission. Get in, get the data, get out. That's all I need to know. But I knew it was more than just recon. The tension in his voice, the way his gaze lingered on the map's red-circled coordinates, the presence of Liam, a marine demolition expert on a scientific expedition, it all pointed to something more. Days turned into weeks as the orca sliced through the icy waters, the monotonous routine of the submarine's life a fragile shield against the growing unease. I spent my time in the comms room, monitoring the radio chatter, analyzing data streams, searching for any clue to the nature of our mission, the threat we were facing. It was during one of these late-night shifts, the only sound the hum of the equipment and the gentle sway of the submarine, that I caught it. A signal. A faint, rhythmic pulse of energy, buried deep within the static, coming from the coordinates we were heading towards. The signal was unlike anything I'd ever encountered before. It wasn't a distress call, wasn't a military transmission, wasn't anything that matched the patterns in my database. It was organic, rhythmic, almost musical. I tried to isolate the signal, to amplify it, to decipher its origin. But it was elusive, fading in and out, its rhythm shifting, morphing, as if alive. I called for Jack, the sonar operator, a seasoned veteran with a keen ear for the subtle nuances of underwater acoustics. He listened, his brow furrowed in concentration, his eyes narrowing as the signal pulsed through the speakers, its strange melody filling the cramped space of the comms room. That's not natural, Ryan, he said finally, his voice low, a hint of unease in his tone. Never heard anything like it before. What do you think it is? I asked, my own curiosity battling against a growing sense of dread. He shook his head, his gaze fixed on the sonar screen, the green blips and lines a cryptic language that only he could fully understand. I don't know, kid, but it's coming from down there, from the trench, from whatever it is we're looking for. He paused, his eyes meeting mine, a shared fear flickering in their depths and I don't think it wants to be found. The air inside the orca grew thick with anticipation as we neared our destination. The dive, a slow, steady descent into the abyss, felt like a journey into the heart of darkness. The deeper we went, the colder the water, the heavier the silence, the more palpable the tension among the crew. I sat at my station in the comms room, the glow of the monitors casting an eerie green light on my face, the rhythmic hum of the sonar a constant, pulsing reminder of the unknown that surrounded us. The signal, that strange, organic rhythm I'd picked up days ago, was stronger now, its presence a constant murmur in the background, a whisper that seemed to weave its way into my thoughts, my dreams. Approaching target depth, the captain's voice, clipped and authoritative, crackled over the intercom. All stations report. The responses were curt, professional, each crew member masking their fear with the practiced calm of seasoned sailors. But I could hear the tremor in their voices, the subtle shifts in tone that betrayed their unease. Sonar report, Captain Reed ordered. Jack, his voice tense, his eyes fixed on the sonar screen, hesitated for a moment before responding. Readings are anomalous, Captain. 
There's something down there. Something big. Can you get a visual? Negative, sir. The water's too murky. The signal's interfering with our sensors. Interfering? Dr. Keller's voice, a mix of excitement and apprehension, crackled over the intercom. That's remarkable. The energy source must be immense. Doctor, we're not here to speculate, Captain Reed snapped, his tone brooking no argument. We're here to gather data. Stick to your protocols. I could feel the tension rising, the clash between Keller's scientific curiosity and Reed's rigid adherence to military protocol. It was a tension that had been building since the moment we'd left the base, a simmering distrust fueled by the captain's secrecy, his refusal to divulge the true nature of our mission. Prepare the submersible, Captain Reed ordered. Liam, you'll lead the recon team. Kestrel, you're with them. Dr. Sarah, you'll be in charge of sample collection and analysis. My heart hammered against my ribs, a frantic beat against the growing dread. A recon mission into the heart of the anomaly, into the unknown. Liam clapped a hand on my shoulder, his grip firm, reassuring. Don't worry, Ryan, he said, a wry grin on his face. We'll be back before you know it. Just a quick peek, then back to the surface for coffee and donuts. But his words couldn't mask the tension in his eyes, the grim set of his jaw. He was a marine, a warrior, a man who knew the smell of fear, and he could sense it now, thick in the air of the orca, a scent as potent as the diesel fumes and the recycled air that sustained us in this metal tomb. The submersible, a cramped, teardrop-shaped vessel, detached from the orca with a shudder, its powerful lights cutting through the inky blackness, illuminating a world of swirling shadows and silent, unseen dangers. As we descended, the pressure building around us, the hum of the entity growing louder, more insistent, a rhythmic pulse that seemed to synchronize with my own heartbeat, I knew, with a chilling certainty, that we were entering a realm beyond human comprehension. A realm where the laws of nature, the rules of logic, no longer applied. And as the submersible's lights revealed the source of the signal, a colossal luminescent sphere that seemed to pulse with a life of its own, I realized, with a growing sense of dread, that we had made a terrible mistake. We had awakened something, Ancient, something powerful, something that should have remained undisturbed. The submersible rocked gently, its powerful lights cutting through the inky blackness of the trench, illuminating the source of the signal. A sphere of impossible size, its surface a mosaic of swirling, iridescent colors, pulsing with a hypnotic rhythm. It was like something out of a dream, a vision from a science fiction novel, a testament to the universe's boundless capacity for wonder and terror. What the hell is that? Liam's voice, usually calm and steady, cracked with a mixture of awe and apprehension. He gripped the controls of the submersible, his eyes glued to the viewport, his knuckles white. Dr. Keller, his face illuminated by the sphere's eerie glow, was practically vibrating with excitement. His notebook clutched tightly in his hand, his pencil scribbling furiously. It's magnificent, he breathed, his voice a hushed whisper. I've never seen anything like it. The energy readings, the patterns, it's, it's beyond anything I could have imagined. Dr. Sarah, ever the pragmatist, her gaze flitting between the sphere and the submersible's instrument panel, was less enthralled. We need to proceed with caution, she said, her voice tight. This thing, it's emitting a powerful electromagnetic field. It could be interfering with our systems. We're here to investigate, Doctor. Captain Reed's voice, cold and hard, crackled over the intercom. Get a sample of that substance and see if you can get a reading on those emissions. I felt a surge of unease. The captain's orders, his tone, the way he emphasized certain words, it was like he already knew what we were dealing with as if this mission was more than just a reconnaissance. Liam maneuvered the submersible closer to the sphere, its lights illuminating the surface, revealing intricate patterns, swirling glyphs that seemed to shift and move as we watched. The sonar's going haywire, Jack reported, his voice tense. It's, 
like the sphere is absorbing the sound waves, I can't get a clear reading. The EM field is fluctuating, Sarah added, her voice a tight whisper. It's pulsating, in sync with the light patterns. I could feel it too, a subtle vibration that seemed to resonate through the metal hull of the submersible, a rhythmic hum that pulsed in my teeth, in my bones, in my mind. Liam, his face pale now, his eyes narrowed, glanced at me. This is getting weird, Ryan, he muttered, his hand instinctively reaching for the weapon strapped to his thigh. Real weird. Dr. Sarah, using the submersible's robotic arm, managed to extract a sample of the bioluminescent substance that coated the sphere's surface. It pulsed in the container, a vibrant, otherworldly blue that seemed to mimic the sphere's rhythmic glow. It's organic, she said, her voice a mix of awe and fear. I've never seen anything like it. The cellular structure, the bioluminescence. It's, it's like nothing on Earth. Keller, who had been silent, his gaze fixed on the sphere, his fingers still scribbling frantically in his notebook, suddenly spoke. It's communicating, he said, his voice a hushed whisper, his eyes wide, unblinking. It's trying to tell us something. Captain Reed's voice, sharp and cold, crackled over the intercom. Doctor, I suggest you stick to your area of expertise. We're not here to engage in... conversation. But Keller, as if possessed, ignored him. He reached out a trembling hand towards the sphere, his fingers tracing the swirling glyphs, his lips moving silently as if reciting an ancient prayer. And then, the lights flickered, the submersible shuddered violently, and the humming, that rhythmic pulse, intensified, morphing into a deep, resonant voice that seemed to fill the entire vessel, a voice that spoke not in words, but in sensations, fear, dread, a sense of overwhelming malice. It's angry, Keller whispered, his eyes wide with a manic gleam. We, we have disturbed it. And as the submersible plunged into darkness, the entity's presence a suffocating weight, its voice a deafening roar in our minds, we knew with a terrifying certainty that we were no longer in control. The submersible's emergency lights flickered back on, casting a sickly green glow on the cramped interior. I blinked, my vision blurry, my head throbbing with a dull ache. Disorientation washed over me, the familiar sensations of the dive replaced by a disjointed sense of wrongness. Liam? Sarah? I croaked, my voice raspy. Liam groaned, his hand reaching up to touch his forehead, his face pale in the eerie light. Dr. Sarah was slumped against the control panel, her eyes closed, her breathing shallow. What? What the hell happened? Liam muttered, his voice thick with confusion. We, we lost power, I said, my gaze darting to the instrument panel, the needles on the dials jumping erratically, the digital readouts a jumble of nonsensical symbols. That's not possible, Liam said, his brow furrowed. This sub has multiple redundant power systems, an EMP. That's the only thing that could... He trailed off, his eyes widening as he turned towards Dr. Keller who was sitting motionless in his seat, staring out the viewport, his face illuminated by the sphere's eerie glow, a serene smile playing on his lips. Keller's notebook lay open on his lap, the pages filled with frantic scribbles, the ink smeared, the words a jumble of scientific jargon and cryptic phrases that made my skin crawl. The sphere, it spoke to me, he whispered, his voice a distant echo, his eyes still fixed on the glowing orb outside. It, it showed me things, things beyond our comprehension. Keller, snap out of it, I said, reaching for him, my hand hovering over his shoulder. But something in his gaze, a coldness, an emptiness, made me hesitate. It's no use, Ryan, Liam said, his voice low, a grim understanding in his tone. He's gone. Whatever that thing is, it's got him. A chill, deeper than the frigid waters outside, ran down my spine. I'd seen that look before, in the eyes of men who'd been pushed beyond their limits, men who'd seen things they couldn't unsee, men who'd lost their humanity. We need to get back to the surface, I said, my voice tight with urgency. Now. 
but as Liam reached for the controls, a wave of nausea washed over me. The submersible, instead of rising, was... descending. What the... Liam muttered, his hands moving frantically across the control panel. The ballast tanks. They're not responding. We're... we're going deeper. It's the sphere, Keller whispered, his voice a hollow echo in the cramped space. It's... drawing us in. The humming intensified, vibrating through the hull, through our bodies, through our minds. And the whispers, those faint, unsettling whispers that had haunted the edges of our consciousness, they were louder now, more insistent, a chorus of voices that seemed to emanate from the water itself, from the very walls of the submersible. Welcome, join us, become one with the deep. The lights flickered again, casting the submersible's interior in a strobing, nightmarish glow. The instruments spun wildly, their needles dancing a chaotic ballet, the readouts a jumble of meaningless symbols. And outside the viewport, the sphere, its pulsating light now a blinding white, seemed to be... growing. We were trapped, descending into the abyss, drawn towards an ancient, unknowable power that was beyond our comprehension, beyond our control. And as the pressure built, the darkness closed in, and the whispers intensified, I knew with a chilling certainty that we were not alone. We were expected. The orca, a symphony of groaning metal and failing systems, shuddered around me, the relentless pressure of the crushing depths a tangible presence. The emergency lights cast a sickly green glow across the control room, illuminating the faces of the crew, their features twisted with a mixture of fear and despair. Depth? Captain Reed's voice, usually a commanding baritone, was strained, tight with a fear he tried to mask beneath a veneer of authority. Six thousand meters. And dropping, sir, the chief engineer responded, his voice a shaky whisper. Ballast tanks are unresponsive. We can't stop the descent. Panic clawed at my throat, a cold dread that tightened like a vice around my chest. We were sinking, pulled down into the abyss by an unseen force, a malevolent intelligence that was playing with us, toying with our technology, our sanity. The signal, that haunting rhythmic pulse, was deafening now, a relentless drumbeat that vibrated through the hull, through our bones, through our minds. It was no longer a distant murmur, a whispered invitation. It was a command, an imperative, a siren song of doom. We're losing it, Captain, Lieutenant Adams shouted, his hands flying across the communications panel his face slick with sweat. The entity, it's jamming our systems. I can't, I can't get a signal through. We're on our own, Liam muttered, his hand gripping the stock of his rifle, his eyes scanning the shadows that danced at the edges of the flickering emergency lights. He was right. We were trapped, isolated, cut off from the world above, at the mercy of something that existed beyond our comprehension, beyond our control. What do we do, sir? The question, voiced by a young sonar technician, hung in the air, a desperate plea for guidance in a situation that defied all logic, all reason. Captain Reed, his face grim, his jaw clenched tight, hesitated for a moment, his gaze sweeping over the faces of his crew, the fear, the doubt, the dawning realization that we might not make it out of this alive. We, we follow protocol, he said finally his voice a hollow echo of its usual authority. Prepare for unidentified contact, all hands to battle stations. But even as he issued the orders, I could see the doubt in his eyes, the flicker of fear that he couldn't quite conceal. He knew, as we all knew, that protocols, training, weapons, none of it mattered in the face of the unknown, the unthinkable. The hum intensified, morphing into a deep, resonant moan that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the submarine, a sound that vibrated through my bones, a symphony of dread that resonated with a primal fear I'd never known existed. The whispers started, faint at first, then growing louder, more insistent, a chorus of voices that seemed to seep into our minds, feeding our doubts, amplifying our fears. I saw faces in the darkness, the faces of the men who'd been lost on the previous missions, 
their eyes hollow, their expressions a mix of sorrow and accusation. I felt the icy grip of the water closing in, the crushing pressure of the depths, the terror of drowning, of being consumed by something vast and ancient. Liam, his face pale, his voice a strained whisper, grabbed my arm. We need to get out of here, Ryan, he said, his eyes pleading. This, this is madness. We're all going to die down here. But how? The comms were down, the engines unresponsive, the submersible base sinking deeper, deeper into the abyss, drawn towards the source of the signal, towards the heart of the entity's power. There's another way, Dr. Keller said, his voice a raspy whisper, his eyes gleaming with a manic intensity. The entity, it's communicating. It wants to show us something. He moved towards the comms panel, his fingers trembling, his gaze fixed on the static-filled screen, as if he could see something beyond the noise, beyond the chaos. It wants a conduit, a vessel. He turned to me, his eyes burning into mine, his smile a grotesque parody of human expression. You, Ryan, you are the chosen one. Keller's words, you, you are the chosen one, reverberated in the darkness, his voice a twisted mockery of its former warmth. His eyes, once filled with a scientific curiosity, now burned with an unnatural intensity, a cold alien light that made my skin crawl. The hum, that rhythmic pulse that had haunted us since our descent, intensified, resonating with a primal force that seemed to shake the very core of my being. I could feel the entity's presence, a suffocating weight pressing down on us, its whispers slithering into my mind, tempting me with promises of knowledge, of power, of a truth that lay beyond the veil of human comprehension. Get away from him, Doc, Liam shouted, his voice a raw bark, his hand reaching for the pistol strapped to his thigh. But Captain Reed, his face a mask of grim determination, stepped forward, blocking Liam's path. Stand down, Lieutenant, he said, his voice a low growl. We have our orders. We will complete the mission. Sir, with all due respect, Liam argued, his eyes wide with a mixture of fear and defiance. The mission's gone to hell. This thing, it's taken Keller. It's messing with our minds. We need to get out of here before it takes us all. But Reed, his gaze fixed on Keller, on the distorted smile that twisted his lips, on the unnatural light that seemed to emanate from his eyes, shook his head. The entity has chosen its conduit, he said, his voice a hollow whisper. We cannot interfere. Interfere? I shouted, my own fear boiling over into anger. It's killing us. It's driving us mad. And you're just going to stand there and let it happen? But Reed's eyes, cold and calculating, met mine, a warning in their depths. You don't understand, Lieutenant. This is bigger than us. Bigger than the Navy. This is about the future of humanity. He turned back to Keller, who was now chanting in that same guttural language, the words a rhythmic pulse that seemed to synchronize with the hum, with the beating of my own heart. Doctor, Reed said, his voice a low, respectful tone. What are your instructions? Keller, or whatever entity now controlled his body, his mind, his very soul, tilted his head, his gaze sweeping over us, his smile widening, the needle-sharp teeth gleaming in the flickering light. We require a vessel, a sacrifice. His eyes fixed on me. Lieutenant Kestrel will serve. The crew gasped, their faces pale, their eyes wide with a mixture of horror and relief. I stumbled back, my hand reaching for my pistol. But Liam, his face a mask of grim determination, grabbed my arm. We're not letting them take you, Ryan, he whispered, his voice a low growl. Not without a fight. He pulled me towards the exit, his hand on my shoulder, his grip firm, reassuring. We're going to get you out of here, buddy, I promise. We fought our way through the corridors, the air thick with the stench of fear and sweat, the whispers chasing us, taunting us, promising us oblivion. The station creaked and groaned around us, the lights flickering erratically, the metal walls sweating with a cold, damp fear. 
I could feel the entity's presence, a suffocating weight that pressed down on us, its influence a poison seeping into my mind, twisting my thoughts, my perceptions. I saw flashes of my past, my childhood, my family, my wife, their faces twisted into grotesque masks of pain, their voices distorted, mocking, accusing. You failed us. You let us down. You're not worthy. But Liam's voice, a steady beacon in the storm of madness, cut through the whispers. Focus, Ryan. Don't listen to it. It's trying to break you. He pushed me forward, his hand on my back, urging me onward, towards the escape hatch, towards the flimsy hope of the surface, towards freedom. But as we reached the hatch, a metal barrier against the crushing depths, a horrifying realization dawned on me. The whispers, they weren't coming from the entity. They were coming from inside my own head. The realization hit me like a physical blow. The whispers, the doubts, the insidious voices that had been plaguing me. They weren't the entity. They were mine. My own fears, my own regrets, amplified, distorted, weaponized against me. Liam, I said, my voice a strained whisper, my hand trembling as I reached out to touch his arm. The rough fabric of his combat fatigues a grounding sensation in the swirling chaos of my mind. I think... I think it's got me too. Liam's eyes, hard and determined, met mine, a flicker of understanding passing between us. He didn't hesitate. He grabbed my arm, pulled me close, his voice a low, urgent growl. We're getting out of here, Ryan. Together. Don't fight it. Let it fuel you. Use its anger, its fear against it. He shoved me towards the escape hatch, his hand a firm pressure between my shoulder blades. Go. I'll hold it off. Get to the surface. Get help. I didn't argue. The whispers were screaming now, a chorus of madness that threatened to drown out any rational thought. I could feel the entity's pull, a seductive siren song that promised oblivion, an end to the torment. But Liam's words, his belief in me, his willingness to sacrifice himself. It gave me a sliver of hope, a reason to fight. I clambered through the hatch, the metal cold against my skin, the sound of rushing water a reminder of the unforgiving depths that awaited us if we failed. The escape pod, a cramped metal sphere designed for emergency evacuations, was our only chance. I slammed the hatch shut, the bolts locking into place with a reassuring clang, a temporary barrier against the chaos that was unfolding outside. The emergency lights flickered, casting the interior of the pod in a strobing red glow, the air thick with the stench of sweat and fear. I strapped myself into the pilot's seat, my hands trembling as I ran through the pre-launch sequence. The whispers were relentless now, their voices a cacophony of doubt, of despair, of the entity's insidious influence. You're weak. You're a failure. You'll never escape. But Liam's voice, a distorted crackle over the intercom, cut through the noise. Ryan, get us out of here, now! It's... it's breaking through. I hit the launch button, the pod shuddering violently as it tore free from the collapsing base, its engines roaring, a defiant scream against the crushing pressure of the deep. I could hear the entity's rage, its frustration, as its grip on the base, on our minds, weakened. We were ascending, rising, a tiny speck of hope against the vastness of the ocean, the unknown depths that held secrets best left undisturbed. But as we breached the surface, the sunlight a blinding glare after the eternal darkness of the trench, I knew it wasn't over. The comms were still dead, the emergency beacon unresponsive. We were alone, adrift, and the entity its whispers now a faint but persistent echo in the back of my mind. It was still out there, somewhere in the depths, waiting. Days later, a Coast Guard cutter found us, a speck of metal bobbing on the vast expanse of the ocean. The crew, their faces a mix of shock and disbelief, pulled us aboard, their questions met with confused silence. Liam was gone, vanished, lost somewhere in the final moments of the escape. Another victim claimed by the darkness. I was taken to a naval hospital, quarantined, interrogated, subjected to a battery of tests that couldn't explain the gaps in my memory, the nightmares, 
the lingering sense of dread that clung to me like a shroud. They released me eventually, my story dismissed as a case of deep sea psychosis, the official report citing equipment malfunction, human error, the unforgiving nature of the environment. The truth, though, the truth of what we found, what we unleashed, it remained buried, classified, a secret that the powers that be wanted to keep hidden, a secret that they hoped would sink back into the abyss, forgotten. But I couldn't forget. The whispers, they were still there, a constant reminder of the entity's presence, its power, its patience. I knew, with a chilling certainty, that it was waiting, watching, learning, and that one day, it would return. I tried to warn them. I tried to tell them what we'd found, what we'd unleashed. But no one listened. They wanted to believe in the illusion of control, the comforting lie that the world was a rational, ordered place, a world where the darkness could be contained, where the secrets of the deep remained buried. So I left the Navy, disappeared into the anonymity of civilian life, a ghost haunting the edges of a world that no longer made sense. But the nightmares continued, the whispers intensified, the signal, that rhythmic pulse of the entity's presence, it grew stronger, a beacon in the darkness, a countdown to something. And as I sit here now, at my desk, the window open, the night air cold against my skin, I hear it, a faint, rhythmic knocking, a sound that seems to come from everywhere at once, from the walls, from the floor, from the depths of my own mind. It's calling to me, and I know, with a chilling certainty, that I can't resist it forever. <laughs>